precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. I was so lost, I should have died, but you have brought me to your side to be led by your staff and rod and to be called the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. O wash me in his precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and grace. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good. Great to be here. Thanks, Rich, for leading our songs. Actually sounded pretty good, I thought, for being yeah. outside. Uh, it is nice to be not looking at a screen of some sort this morning for worship, but actually to be looking at faces, so it, it's great. Um, you know, one of the most important parts of communion is that Greek word koinonia, that we share. Koinonia means communion, community, fellowship, closeness, all those things that we share during this time where we're uh, sharing in the Lord's Supper together. And over these past couple months, that's been a little challenging. You know, we've tried to maybe take, take it together at the same time, but it's not the same as being here together. So speaking to those who are uh, watching us on the uh, remotely at the streaming or we'll watch this later we look forward to the time when you guys can be back here with us and we can all be together uh been a lot to process over these last couple months uh certainly one of the more challenging times for me as a, the 10 years i've been a shepherd here i would imagine bob feels the same way uh and as I was thinking about what to talk about this morning, just a, uh, a few things just kept coming into my head. And one is how broken the world is. And it's full of sin, full of death. And, you know, regardless of where you fall on this COVID-19 pandemic spectrum, whether it's really serious or not that, big a deal. Uh, it certainly has reminded us of the fragility of life, um, how we can be healthy one minute and sick the next, dying the next. Uh, you know, as James says, you know, life can be a vapor and just go like that. And reminds us that our earthly bodies won't last. And sadly, we've seen that in our own community here. The events of these last several weeks have also reminded us that Satan is alive and well and active in the world. We see evil, we see uh, hatred, we see injustice, we see racism, we see oppression, we see division. So what are we to do about this brokenness? So do we say, hey, uh, 
you know, we're to be in this world, but not of this world. So, you know, this is kind of our pit stop to heaven, you know, so not be that concerned. No, we are, we are called to bring the kingdom to this earth. And, you know, when you think about what we've done these last few months of not having, not having worship, and I know not everybody agreed, agreed with those decisions, but we are called to love our neighbor, to be good neighbors, to love our community, to show care for our community. And I think uh, whether you agree with what we've done or not, it was important that we showed this, this community that. And, you know, as, as Dave has reminded us uh, in his messages, we are called to be uh, salt and light and instruments of peace out there to stand up for injustice, for racism, for evil, and all those things. We're to be reconcilers, as Dave reminded us last week. But no, how, no matter how much we make the world better, it'll never be perfect enough. It'll never be righteous enough. But praise God that he provided a solution to the world's brokenness. And that's to send his son on the cross to die for us. You know, Jesus said in John 16, he said, hey, this world, paraphrasing, so <laughs> this world is messed up. He's got to be messed up, but I have overcome the world. And Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 15 that because Jesus died on the cross, and was resurrected, we are also victorious over sin and death. So let's think about that this morning as we share in this uh, communion together. So I'm going to pray for the bread and cup together. So bow with me, please. Father in heaven, uh, we're just we're thankful that we can be here this morning to share in this communion time together. So thankful that you love the world so much that you gave your son that we might be able to stand holy and pure in, in your sight. Just thank you so much for his sacrifice on the cross. Thank you for this bread representing his broken body, for this cup representing his blood that was shed. And just thank you so much that he was willing to do that. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. We're not going to be collect, taking up a collection, but there are offering boxes. And I just want to say thank you for your continued generosity and giving to the church these last couple months in this time of uncertainty. We know several of you have been impacted economically, but you still continue to give. And we just appreciate that so much. Um, so let me, let me pray for the offering. Father in heaven, thank you for taking care of our needs, uh, for providing us in this life what we need to live each day. We just know that everything comes from you, and we just uh, praise you and thank you for blessing this church. Uh, pray that you'll uh, continue to bless our staff, Dave and Todd and Adrian, continue to be with Bob and I and all of our ministry leaders, and just uh, help us to continue to strive to be uh, your kingdom here and to reach out to uh, this community and to just grow in love for you and each other. It's in your son's name we pray, amen. Can you hear me? Hello, hello. Can you hear me? 
A little bit? Hear me a little bit. Thank you for the hat offer. Uh, I bullfrogged up really well before I came out, so lots of sunscreen for me. Um, welcome to Tailgate Church. Glad you guys could be here for this. Oh, man, what a... Something different, for sure. Happy Father's Day. To all you dads out here, if you aren't aware of it yet, um, there are paydays uh, on the table underneath the over, overhang there. Uh, everybody gets a payday because none of you'd be here without a dad, and this is in honor of your fathers, uh, what these paydays are for. Uh, so make sure you grab one if you want on the way out. I put them out there with gloves on, so they're lovely. Um, thank again, thanks again, you guys, for, for being here. Appreciate it. And thinking real quickly here about Father's Day. What do you want me to do? Raise it or lower it or? Probably raise it. Raise it. Father's Day makes me think about a story that Philip Yancey told. He had gone to visit his mom and his father had died many years prior uh, as a young man. He had contracted polio uh, in his 20s. And if you're old enough, you might remember uh, how devastating polio was uh, several years ago. And uh, so he was, Philip was visiting his mom, whom he was very close with, and they were going through old pictures. I don't know about you, but when I go back and visit my mom, we always go through old pictures and look at those. So he's going through these old pictures and uh, he finds one that's just bent up and, and it's got little chunks taken out of the edges. It's just, it's pretty rough in the, in the condition of it. And he asks his mom, why did you keep this picture? Because you've got other pictures of me uh, from the same time. Why this one? And she said, I keep this one because this one was special. And she began to tell him about when his father... Uh, was in an iron lung uh, when he when he had polio uh, that nobody could go in and visit him and as if the disease progressed and he was getting worse he asked his wife to bring pictures and this is when Philip was you know less than one year old and so she brought pictures and they just crammed them in in between the metal knobs in front of his face so he could look at the pictures of his son and his wife, people he loved the most. And Philip began to reflect on that and it reminded him of when he was in college and he came to faith. He said, it was just like then because here's evidence of someone who was full of love for me that I had no memory of, no memories of, of contact of any kind with uh, all I know him through is through stories but he was real and he was full of love for me and he knew that God that we don't get to touch him and he doesn't sing to us and cook us scrambled eggs on Saturdays and, and things like that but he is real he is there and uh, he is full of love for his kids, for his children. And that's what I think he wants all of us, but today on Father's Day, it's especially, he wants us fathers to be like that, be full of love for our kids. Fa parenting in general is, is tough. I mean, that's the way it is. We're, we're fallen creatures. Um, got to keep coming back to that. Be full of love for your kids. So I want to pray, uh, especially for our, our dads here this morning. Thank you for our fathers, God. Um, as I've said before, uh, all of our fathers were not cut from the same cloth, and we've had some tough times with our, our own dads and, and some great times. Uh, some of us have known and loved our fathers well. Some of us, have, it's just been difficult, uh, our relationships with our fathers. But we know you're a good father, and we who 
are here now who are fathers, we want to be more and more like you in the way that we father our kids. Help us to be that way. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. So we are going to be back in the Joseph story here this morning. Um, if you haven't been here, uh, well, you haven't been here, I know that, uh, but if you haven't uh, ever been been involved with our church here or our worship, we've been looking at the life of Joseph in Genesis, the first book of the Bible, and seeing what we can learn about God through his life. And um, I'm going to ask you this. Have you ever had to take a test and you just, you just go blank? I mean, it's test time and it's just, woo, I mean, nothing. Your memory has just, for some reason, failed you. I had a classmate when I was in... Uh, my marriage and family program in grad school named Trudy and at the end of our two-year program we had to take oral exams and in the oral exams basically the uh, instruction for us was anything you've had over the last two years is fair game you know, see you at the appointed time so okay two years and uh, their goal was to uh, through their questioning they were they were very flexible in how they approached their orals. Their goal was to help you realize you have learned a lot through the questions that they ask you, but also make you realize there's plenty of you for, to still learn, you know, plenty to still learn that you need to do. Uh, so they're looking for that sweet spot with every person. Well, uh, my friend Trudy came in and they had to completely readjust what the sweet spot was because she couldn't remember anything. And after two years, she could not remember a thing. And they knew that she was a great therapist. They'd watched her over the last two years. But for some reason, she just went totally blank. And we really felt for her because of that. And she couldn't, she just couldn't remember anything. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. Uh, we have some movies that deal with memory issues. If you ever saw uh, Finding Nemo, Dory, right? Dory the fish cannot remember things uh, to save her life. I mean, she's just constantly forgetting uh, men in black several years ago dealt with some some memory sorts of things and a way to erase some memories if you've never seen it they had these the governmental authorities that the men in black had this little pen that they could hold up and set the dial for how much of your memory they wanted you to erase and hit a button and a flash would go out and you could forget the previous 10 minutes or the previous 30 minutes you know um, there might be some things you wish you could do that for, right? Be able to forget some things that are unpleasant memories that you have. Then one of my favorite characters, Jason Bourne. One of the storylines with him is that he's got some memory issues. He, he has had some of his memory intentionally erased. He cannot remember some things. He is a uh, special ops, governmental agent, spy, and he's had some memories erased. And, but as the, the story progresses, some of these memories begin to come back, right? And these refreshed memories begin to affect how he lives his life. It's going to greatly impact his future as he remembers the things that have happened to him. So in the Joseph story today, I want us to be thinking about memories and exams. Now, most of the Joseph story that we've been looking at thus far has taken place in Egypt. All the events have pretty much, the, except for the very beginning, they've, they've all been in Egypt. Now, the focus is going to shift back to Canaan. So Joseph's father, Jacob, is still there, and he has got a large family that's still there. Uh, if you just do the counting that they have listed there, it's somewhere like 65 to 70 people in his family. So that takes a very large turkey at Thanksgiving, right? 65 to 70 people you want to feed? The problem, though, is that it doesn't look like there's going to be any Thanksgiving this year because there's no food. That famine that Pharaoh had a dream about has come to pass. And so Jacob and his family have money. The problem is there's nothing on the shelves at Safeway for them to spend it on. And so they are beginning to get hungry as well. The whole time that Joseph has been down in Egypt, 
going through his ordeals. What's been going on with the brothers back in Canaan? It's 20 plus years. Well, we're really not told. You know, there's no record of what went on, but we could probably safely guess a couple of things. First, uh, all of his brothers have grown the same number of years that Joseph has, and so they're probably middle-aged men by now with families of their own. And secondly, and more importantly, they have had 20 plus years to wrestle with their horrible secret of selling their brother and faking his death to their father. And maybe they never talked about it with each other. Maybe there was sort of this conspiracy of, uh, of silence among them. There's certainly been sort of a self-imposed assault on their conscience, right? It's a lot of work to push down a, a bad memory, uh, to try to silence that image of Joseph begging and screaming, 17-year-old Joseph just pleading with them to not sell him to these slave traders. It takes a lot of work to try to wish that away. And so... I don't know. Maybe they wish the men in black could come and show up and with a flashy pen and erase that. Because that's a, that's a lot to try to live with. But whatever they've been able to suppress, it is about to be awakened. Because at the beginning of chapter 42 in Genesis, Jacob tells his sons in the middle of this family, he goes, what are you guys sitting around looking at each other for? I mean, come on. We don't have any food here. Go down to Egypt and get some food. And I'm wondering if, you know, they might have been hesitant to go down to Egypt because maybe they had a bad taste in their mouth when the idea of Egypt would come up. You know, that's the place we sold our brother off to, was Egypt. But Egypt has now become sort of the world's soup kitchen. Kitchen, And so when Joseph says, uh, uh, when uh, Jacob says go, they, they go. It's time to go. But Jacob won't let his youngest son, Benjamin, go. All the others go, but not him. And Benjamin is Joseph's younger, full brother, right? He's the other son that was born to Rachel, Jake, Jacob's favorite wife. And since Jacob believes Joseph to be what? He thinks he's dead, right? It seems like Benjamin may have taken his place kind of rising to the top of the, the pecking order of sons of Jacob. And so Joseph or Jacob still seems like he might be playing some favorites. And so we're going to pick up in verse, if you've got a Bible, uh, pick up in verse 6 of chapter 42 of Genesis. Uh, it says, Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the one who sold grain to all its people. And so when Joseph's brothers arrived, what they do? They bowed down. They bowed down to Joseph with their faces to the ground. And as soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger. And he spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from? He asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. And although Joseph recognized his brothers, they didn't recognize him. Why not? Why didn't they recognize Joseph? Well, the last time they saw Joseph, he was 17. So now he's at least 37. Okay? A lot can happen between 17 and 37. Joseph also was, for those 20 plus years, he's been in Egypt. And so he looks like an Egyptian, right? He walks like an Egyptian. He's speaking. Egyptian. And so there's no reason for them to recognize him. Even if they ran into Joseph, he wouldn't be royalty, right? But they can't even entertain the idea of that happening because they believe he's dead. He's died a long time ago. So why did Joseph recognize them though? Well, you got 10 brothers from Canaan showing up. He knows who they are. Well, with their appearing and their bowing, Joseph's 
memories are now awakened. He's thinking the dream that I had so long ago when I was a teenager, the dream is true. They bowed. But he's also thinking, these are the guys that sold me. We, do we have any unfinished business here, they and I? So what do I do now? Well, now come the exams. We're thinking about memories and exams here. Joseph has been awakened, and now the brothers are about to go through some exams uh, that begin to wake up their memories. And these brothers, they don't know the exams are coming. They have no idea. They're not even aware that they're taking them, but they are going to count nonetheless. And so these brothers are going to get tested to see if they're sorry. Are you sorry for what you did to me years ago? Have you changed? Have you matured? Have you repented? And how they do on these tests is going to greatly impact the rest of their lives. As so we pick up in verse 9, it says, speaking of Joseph, Then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, You guys are spies. You've come to see where our land's unprotected. No, my lord, they answered. Your servants have come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. Your servants are, what? Honest men. Not spies. No, he said. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, your servants were 12 brothers, the sons of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father, and one is no more. And Joseph said to them, no, it's just as I said, you guys are spies. And this is how you'll be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here to me. So how would you like to work for some company and they send you on a business trip to the Middle East and you arrive there and you go through customs and all of a sudden some guys with machine guns show up, take you to the side and they continually insist that you are a spy. Joseph's brothers are feeling pretty uncomfortable right now. They quickly deny and say that they're what? Honest men. You should know Joseph loved hearing that one, right? Honest men. And they say that one is no more. And Joseph is wondering, uh, yeah, how did, how did that happen? And what would you be like if you knew that he still was? And what does Joseph keep calling them? He keeps calling them spies. Why? I think Joseph is trying to recreate his story with his brothers, with the roles reversed. He's playing on their memories, trying to wake them up. What was Joseph's reputation with his brothers when he was a teenager back in Canaan? He was the tattletale, right? He spied on them and gave bad reports about them. And so now he says, you guys are spies. And he throws them into prison. Just like they threw Joseph in a pit, he's throwing them in the pit now. Now, part of this exam seems a little bit bizarre. I mean, how is Benjamin coming to Egypt going to prove that they aren't spies? It would substantiate that they had a younger brother like they said they did, but I don't know how that makes you know any sort of statement that they're not, they're, they're not spies. I think Joseph's trying to figure out where they are with their brother Benjamin. And he might be wondering, has Benjamin been thrust into my role now that I am not with them anymore? So originally, go Bart. Originally, Joseph was only going to let one brother go back, but he modifies his plan. Why? We're guessing here. Uh, one thing I think is he probably knows that they really are hungry, and one brother trying to carry enough food for that huge family back there is not going to be able to cut it. So I'm worried about that. 
I think he also might be worried about his dad. You know, if I keep all, uh, you know, if I keep nine brothers and send one back, it might put my dad over the edge there. But maybe most importantly, keeping one brother back sends, it fits, it fits the, the story, this, this reconstruction role reversal story better. And I think he's trying to wake them up and see where their hearts are right now. And in a sense, he's asking them a question. Are you, because Simeon's the one that's going to stay, are you willing to abandon Simeon forever? Will you desert him like you deserted me? But that's the offer that he makes to the brothers. And he starts to get some answers to his offer pretty quickly. And he starts to get some answers to the underlying questions that he's asking pretty quickly. Because we pick up in verse 21... And here the brothers are talking to each other in front of Joseph, who has been speaking Egyptian through an, an, through an interpreter. And the brothers say to one another, surely we are being punished. Why? Because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life. But we wouldn't listen. That's why this distress has come on us. And Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. They did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. And so their confession takes place in front of Joseph, thinking that Joseph can't understand what we're saying. So their, conscious, their conscience is sort of waking up. And they feel like a just retribution is coming to them now because of what they've done. And they are apparently all of one mind because of this, because the Hebrew is emphatic in this section here. The we is emphatic. It says, we are guilty. We saw the distress. We wouldn't listen. And they are sensing their comeuppance. And we pick up in verse 24 when Joseph hears this, because he can understand their language unbeknownst to them. And it says, Joseph turned away from them and began to weep. But then he turned back and spoke to them again. He had Simeon taken from them and bound before their eyes. Joseph hears them. And he is filled with emotion because of what they are saying. But now it's his turn. He's been given some exams. Now it's his turn to take another exam of his own. And this is Joseph's exam. Joseph, will you let go of the past? He has opportunity and he has authority, authority to cause some pain here, doesn't he? Nobody's going to question him. He can do what he wants. Will he let it go? You remember back a few chapters earlier, he, he named his first son Manasseh, which means God has taken away the sting of my past. Did you really mean that, Joseph? Because I think it's one thing to see yourself as a forgiver when you're living large and you're kind of, you know, you got more money than you know what to do with, which kind of describes Joseph right now. It's easier to forgive when you're like that and the person who has injured you is really, really far away. That's very different than being forgiving when they are staring at you right in your face, right in front of you. And so God is giving exams to offenders and offendees. And how should they respond? I want to talk to you real quickly about how you ought to take an exam as an offender. And the first thing I think you need to do is to admit guilt. When your conscience is awakened, it's giving you the opportunity to admit guilt. By this point in time, the brothers, what are they not doing anymore? They're not blaming their father, Jacob, for his lousy parenting, for how he favored Joseph all the years that he was growing up over them. They're not blaming their dad for his passiveness. Uh, they are not bringing up the idea that Joseph's the one that got this snappy coat to wear all the time and he wore it all the time and he was just, nah, nah, nah. they're not bringing any of that up. They simply confess 
their own guilt. And I think you and I, we're, we are always tempted to say, okay, I, I did it, but listen to my excuse and cut me some slack. And I understand that our actions are influenced by unfair circumstances sometimes, but ultimately we're accountable for our actions, right? Secondly, the way you take a test as an offender is to demonstrate empathy. These brothers finally acknowledge the distress that Joseph had when he was sold. They said he was terrified and we ignored him. And I think taking the offender exam means grasping the hurt that we have caused. And thirdly, is to walk in humility. They say we're getting what we deserve. This is just. Those are good responses when you're taking an offender exam. We also know have to know how to take an exam as an offendee, as someone who's been injured. Because I think there's some ways that God wants us to respond when that happens. And we're not going to dwell on these because we're going to see them played out in Joseph's life over the next few chapters here. But real quickly, the way that Joseph basically responds is forgiveness, grace, and reconciliation. And if you think about, if you watch the sermon from last week, all of these line up so well with what we were talking about last week with racial reconciliation. All of these. So it's important for us to remember that you and I are in both of these camps frequently, right? We don't just sit in one camp. We're in, we, we find ourselves in both of these camps. And it's important how we take both exams. Well, Simeon, the brother, the one brother, gets put in chains. If you think about it, when's the last time that these guys saw a brother put in chains? The rest of them kind of slog out of Egypt there, and they've got heavy hearts because one of them is left behind. And they know what it's going to take to get him back. So on the way home, another poke at their memories and their conscience. They stop for the night. One of the brothers decides he needs to feed his, his donkey there, and he opens up a sack of grain that they just purchased. And inside is what? All the silver that they used to buy this grain. And he says in verse 28, my silver has been returned, he said to his brothers. Here it is. It's in my sack. And their hearts. It's not like when you find 20 bucks in your pocket, right? You're like, woohoo. No, their hearts sank. And they turned to each other trembling. And what do they say? What is this that God has done to us? None of the brothers think this guy, this one brother's a thief, right? They don't think he's a thief. And unknown to them, Joseph has put all the silver back in their bags. But they didn't say, what is this that the governor has done? What is it that the administrator under the governor in Egypt, you know, what, what is this that he's done? They say, what is this that God has done to us? I think they're convinced. convinced that God is after them, is pursuing them, and they believe that their sins have found them out. And I wonder if the silver reminds them of when they sold Joseph to Egypt, because then on that day, they did what? They, they went home a little heavier in the pocket of silver, but lighter one brother, just like what just happened with Simeon. And I think he's, Joseph is continuing to force his brothers to face their past. And they seemed remorseful when they were incarcerated, right? And when they were in Egypt, they seemed remorseful. Will they still be remorseful when they are, well, now that they are free? Because they could probably reason there's no way that they're going to send a delegation coming to, to look for us over one guy in prison. They're not going to come all the way to Canaan to find us. And so will they be true to their word now that they are free? Will they still feel bad about what has happened? So real quickly, three so what's for you and me. Number one, our life, our lives, they're full of exams, right? 
They're full of exams. We have to make choices all the time. How am I going to behave in this situation? What is my attitude going to be in this situation? And some exams seem not too big, they're just kind of small, and some seem very imposing, very large. And some we can see coming and some are just out of the blue, but we take exams all the time. And I wonder sometimes if some of us need a test like these brothers are getting, or like Joseph is getting, to get us to deal with our past, get us to deal with who we've been, to see if we have changed, if we've matured, if we've learned to be more humble or forgiving or more patient. We have all done things that were wrong. Sometimes they're motivated by anger, sometimes they're motivated by impatience or, or selfishness. And tests come along in our life to reveal our hearts, to show us to ourselves, hey, have you matured? Have you become more like Jesus? Secondly, God might awaken you through some exams to show you how you affect others. Joseph's brothers are being confronted with the hurt that they have caused him. And our 